And Professor Tribe, I've been waiting all day just to turn your microphone on. Uh, the floor is yours, Professor. Thank you, Lawrence. I was very proud of that last answer that my former student, uh, Jason Murray, gave. He's exactly right. There's nothing undemocratic or anti-democratic about Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. In many ways, it's the most democratic provision of the Constitution. It's the one that was put in there specifically to ensure that when someone tries to disenfranchise millions of Americans by preventing the results of a fair presidential election from being implemented, by preventing the peaceful transition of power to the winner of the election, that when someone does that, that shows that the person is so dangerous that he or she can never again be allowed to hold and probably even to seek any office, much less the presidency. The whole point was that Donald Trump demonstrably tried to disenfranchise 80 million Americans by refusing to take no for an answer when they turned him out of office. It wasn't just the violent mob that he incentivized and prodded and encouraged. That was just the climax. There were weeks of plotting and conspiracy involving the scheming to have fake electoral slates, all of that. And very little of that became clear in today's argument because the court was obviously desperate to avoid focusing on what Donald Trump did or why what he did was exactly what the framers of the 14th Amendment had in mind when they said, if you do that, you're never going to get another chance. They didn't want to talk about that. They talked about possible consequences. They feared that maybe somebody would pretend there was an insurrection, forgetting that there are safeguards against that, that the U.S. Supreme Court is in a position to define what constitutes an insurrection. That's what it was being asked to do in this case. And when some of the justices, including Justice Gorsuch and the Chief Justice and even Justice Kagan, suggested that Colorado was trying to rule the whole country by applying some obscure standard or obscure rules of evidence to decide what was an insurrection, that was a fantasy. Colorado isn't saying we have the last word. They were just doing their job by applying the Constitution, subject to the U.S. Supreme Court's final review. And the idea that one state might make a big difference is hardly novel. Have they ever heard of the Electoral College? What about Florida? in Bush v. Gore in the year 2000. Our whole system delegates enormous power to the states under Article II and the 12th Amendment, gives them enormous power to run even the presidential election. And in running that election, they really need to obey the Constitution, part of which is Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Now, there were other aspects of the case that I found intriguing, but why don't you ask me what you have in mind, and I'll I'd rather engage in a conversation than a soliloquy. Well, you just you did just touch on one thing that I was struck by, which was this notion of the the one the miracle of the one state. Uh, how could that possibly be? The one state would decide election. For me, what was so strange about it was that that was raised in that room, in that room, where not just one state decided it. Mm -hmm. But one person, because it was a 5-4 decision uh, right. in, in Bush v. Gore, and one of the people in that decision, Clarence Thomas, was sitting on that bench. And so that means that in a 5-4 decision, it literally came down to one person, whoever that fifth vote was, decided who the president of the United States would be. That's right. And in fact, quite apart from Clarence Thomas, um, Amy Coney Barrett and John Roberts 
and Neil Gorsuch, uh, sorry, and, and Brett Kavanaugh, were actually on the team for George Bush in the case of Bush v. Gore. So it was hardly something that they could have forgotten about. No, the fact is that under our system, states have enormous responsibility. But that responsibility needs to be exercised consistent with the United States Constitution. There was an idea that was floated that maybe if uh, Jack Smith had charged Donald Trump under 18 U.S. Code Section 2383 with the crime of insurrection, and if he were not to be absolutely immune, the issue that is going to come before the court just in days, that then there would have been some magic wand and this problem would have been solved because we would all know what an insurrection was. But in fact, it was the, it's the U.S. Supreme Court that would have to decide whether what happened constituted an insurrection. It's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a shell game. They're simply moving things from one, from, from one uh, column to another. And besides, the decision in this case, which is going to tell Colorado, you acted too soon. Uh, we don't know if maybe this insurrectionist is going to be excused by a vote of two-thirds of the House and two-thirds of the Senate, which could lift the disability. You've got to wait until later. But of course, later is going to come when Donald Trump, unless he loses so decisively that we are rid of the problem, when Donald Trump is at the finish line, at that point, it's impossible to say that it's now, you know, having waited this long, we can't apply Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Section 3 is going to rear its ugly head in any event, or its beautiful head. The fact is that when Donald Trump tries to take office again, if he does, there will be a lot of people who say he is obviously disqualified because he's an insurrectionist. And as an insurrectionist, he is at the very heart of what Section 3 protects the country from. In its decision in this case, the court is not likely to hold that he's not an insurrectionist. It's not likely to take the off-ramp of saying that the presidency among all offices is not covered. It's likely to rely on a much more procedural ground, like it was not appropriate for the state of Colorado in deciding who could run for the primary election to wield this enormous power. But that simply kicks the can down the road. It leaves open the question, if this wasn't an insurrection, what could have been? If the presidency isn't covered, what offices possibly could be? Those issues will become paramount, but at a time when it is impossible to address them calmly, as the court could have done uh, today had it been willing to grapple with the real issues in the case, rather than trying to make it look like it was extraordinary in our system to give the states enormous power.